You're listening to Advancing Our Church. Welcome to Advancing Our Church, a Changing Our World podcast about Catholic stewardship, leadership, and advancement. And I'm your host, Jim Friend. Well, welcome back, everybody. We have a fabulous program planned for you today. On today's show, we have the amazing Carrie Robinson, the founding executive director and global ambassador of the Leadership Roundtable. I'm going to provide an introduction to Carrie, but before I do, let me provide you with some context for today's conversation. Last month, February 28th and 29th, Changing Our World CEO Brian Crimmins and I attended the Leadership Roundtable Summit, which was entitled Crisis to Co-Responsibility creating a new culture of leadership. It was held in Washington, D.C. with over 200 Catholic leaders from around the country and from all disciplines, including bishops, philanthropists, business people, college presidents, nonprofit leaders, diocesan staff, and many other concerned Catholics who brought their considerable talents and expertise to this discussion. On a side note, and the one thing that struck me most in the title of this summit was the word culture. What is the culture of our church today? As we think about the crisis that many of us have been dealing with in our church since the first scandal broke in Boston in 2002, we have to recognize that it was a cultural norm that allowed the bad behavior that was permitted to run rampant. And it's only by looking at the systemic causes of that culture that we'll discern the appropriate actions. It's a challenging time, and sometimes it's the times that define us and the kind of church that will be for the next generation. With that said, let's get to work. A little bit about our special guest today. As I said, Carrie Robinson is the founding executive director and global ambassador of the Leadership Roundtable. She is also a trustee of the Raskob Foundation for Catholic Activities and a member of FATICA, which stands for Foundations and Donors Interested in Catholic Activities. To say that Carrie's resume is impressive would be an understatement. It's also quite extensive. We'll post her entire bio on our show notes, and I encourage you to visit them. Perhaps the most significant contribution and the one that is most dear to her heart, she and her husband, Dr. Michael Capello, who is a professor of medicine at Yale University, have two children, Christopher and Sophie, and you'll hear her talk about her children during the program today. We're so blessed to have Carrie Robinson with us today. And now, without further ado, here is our conversation. Carrie Robinson, welcome to the program. We're so glad to have you on the podcast today. It's wonderful to be with you. So, Carrie, congratulations on the annual summit. It was great to be with you and over 200 Catholic leaders and executives, uh, nonprofit leaders, uh, financial managers, board members, donors uh, from around the country who are so uh, excited uh, about this issue and bring such a diverse expertise across so many disciplines. Uh, the discussions were tremendous. And uh, I, I'm curious, what was uh, what was your impression of the of the summit and uh and how did your board feel about it? Well, our board had the wonderful opportunity to convene immediately at the conclusion of the two-day summit. So I had a privileged chance to hear their reaction, and it was overwhelmingly positive. Uh, I think their assessment mirrors my own, which was that it was a tremendous blessing to have such diverse leaders, ordained religious and lay from all over the country, gathered together to talk about very serious contemporary challenges facing the church, but with a spirit of such determination and such palpable love of the church. Uh, Many of our trustees note it, how intentionally prayerful it was from the very first moment, beginning with an exquisite celebration of the Eucharist uh, with the papal nuncio as our celebrant and Archbishop Gregory as the homilist with a really perfect homily that's, that set the tone for the two days and weaving moments of silence where all 260 participants intentionally entered in prayerful silence for a full two minutes before engaging in table discussions was a, a noted 
um, blessing. And then the prayers that were offered throughout the two days, I think really reminded us all that we are a family of believers and that the Holy Spirit was very palpably present. And with that, we were allowed to speak with with candor and charity and courage. There was a presumption of goodness in one another so that we could enter into deep listening without defensiveness, without prejudgment, uh, and really discern as people who care deeply about the health and vitality of the church for future generations, what the proper course of action should be collectively. Well, you, you, you've articulated it so well, Carrie. I, I couldn't agree more. I felt that uh, the spirit was certainly alive throughout the, the day and a half that we all spent together. What was so notable to me was uh, the presence of young adults throughout the room and certainly in that last panel uh, presentation around young adults and their engagement in Catholic in the Catholic faith and, and in leadership. You guys did a fantastic job of really having a, a great cross representation of folks from many different disciplines and different perspectives. Thank you. It was very much our intention to end the summit with a particular focus on young adults and, and young adult leadership in the church, not in the future, but right now. And we made the conscious decision to have that entire panel be comprised of young adults. Uh, they were extraordinary, articulate, prayerful, and really offered a kind of clarion call of action. We cannot afford to lose this generation. This is the, in the context of the church in the U.S., certainly, this is the best educated generation of Catholics our church has ever known. And I think what you saw from the four presenters and the moderator, Jonathan Lewis, was an example of young adult leadership at its very best. And yet they were quite candid in speaking about the challenges that they have and continue to encounter as young adult leaders. And they spoke on behalf of their generation. Each of them knows other young adults who may not even aspire to leadership in the church, but have been uh, gratuitously turned away. I, I thought it was a great piece of the summit because they were action-oriented, they were proscriptive, and yet everyone left with a sense of hope that if these are reflective of the young adults who can populate our parish councils and our diocesan finance councils and our boards of trustees of Catholic charities, then we would be well served to uh, roll out the welcome mat and do everything we can to remove obstacles that prevent them from exercising their full prophetic and deeply inspiring leadership. Well, I, I couldn't agree more. And, um, you know, as the parent of one young adult and with two more young adults right behind her, um, it was gratifying to me to see such great role models for them of young adults that are so engaged in key leadership positions around the country, making an impact on other young adults, either in their diocese or on a national level. Um, I'm sure that uh, that that for you also had to have some uh, personal uh, grat gratification given the fact that you have a couple of young adults uh, in your life as well. Yes. And Jim, it's, it's interesting because you and I both clearly love the church so much. We have dedicated our lives to strengthening and serving the church and we love our children. And of course, have done everything humanly possible to expose our children to the very best that our church has to offer. So in some ways, our children are especially privileged to be able to see 
the breadth and diversity within the Catholic Church at its very best in the form of diverse ministries of ordained religious and lay people all over the world. And if even our children find it difficult at times to be fully engaged in the, in the church, then what does that say about their peers who may not have parents who are so intentionally dedicated to presenting the church in the clearest and most positive way? Right. I, I have two children, uh, a boy and a girl, 24 and 22, and they are to my utter delight, uh, very much about being beneficial presences in the world, helping to make the, the world better, contributing and to and blessing the world rather than taking from the world. They are Catholic social justice advocates, and yet they have very serious questions about how the church articulates some of its beliefs, particularly around inclusivity, around um, the broad themes of gender and sexuality. And yet I have said to them that in their passion to make the world a more merciful place, a more just place, a more loving and hopeful place, this work is extremely demanding. And I don't know how one does that in the absence of a community that can encourage, sustain, console, hold one accountable, forgive one, and, and provide the sustenance to an individual who wants to risk everything to make the world better. So, so the importance of a, of a community that is there to support and encourage and hold, hold one accountable. And how does one dedicate one's life to making the world better without recourse to the transcendent? And this language makes sense to my children and to other young adults that I have spoken about. It is that community and that access to the transcendent, which is what fuels my own faith and participation in the Catholic Church. So hearing these, these wonderful young adults on the panel and knowing them personally, watching them grow into these beautiful, articulate, faith-filled young leaders, I know that they too recognize that the church offers this and helps sustain them in their leadership. And figuring out how all of us collectively can maximize the capacity for that and, and make the, the connection for young adults is, is our task at hand. I, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, one of the pieces that we struggle with, I think, for young adults also is, as you've said so well, finding a place in their local community which can nourish and strengthen their faith and help them to grow and to have the community of others. That's, uh, that's so well put. And yet, um, as, we, as we look at uh, congregations at communities around the country who are looking to engage young adults, one of the great points that came out of the conference was, you know, this idea of it can't be a token place on the board. Uh, it can't be a, it, it just this idea of tokenism that to have um, a legitimate leadership position or a leadership group with a parish, with a diocese, with your organization that could truly make an impact, that it really needs to be well thought out uh, before you engage young adults in the community so that they really do have a place and can make a difference because they're intelligent people. They can identify when something is token versus something is, is authentic. Yes. And as you recall, Nicole Perrone, one of the panelists on that final panel, referenced a vision for populating every parish council, every diocesan finance council, and every board of trustees of of any Catholic entity in the United States from Georgetown University to the local soup kitchen, 
populating those bodies of um, leadership with young adults. She had had suggested, I think, one young adult on each. This, this vision comes directly from a national young adult leadership formation program that Leadership Roundtable created in partnership with St. Thomas More, the Catholic Chapel and Center at Yale University. And it, its vision is just what Nicole so prophetically laid out for us. Only we say at least two young adults on each of these bodies of, of oversight and, and responsibility and accountability. That's not just um, to, to speak to the, to the idea of, of avoiding the perception of this being just a token. It's to develop a culture where young adults have a seat at the table and are welcomed and appreciated for their voice and their vote. But as you intimated, it is, it is not um, healthy or just to simply randomly choose someone in their 20s and bring them into these leadership positions without the proper formation and and orientation without acclimating them to basic ecclesiology and and canon law and the esteem program engaging students to enliven the ecclesial mission which is this young adult formation program uh, created by St. Thomas More at Yale and Leadership Roundtable is precisely designed to offer this one year curriculum in basic ecclesiology for young adults who have a positive experience of the church because they are at a great Catholic college or they are at a secular university with a wonderful Newman Center. And and they're actively engaged in the life of the church while on campus. They are identified by their campus minister as someone who has enormous leadership potential and the personal invitation into this year-long esteem curriculum before they graduate is exactly the kind of formation and acclimation that is required. This issues in a commissioning ceremony, which essentially at the end of the year's curriculum uh, presents the young adult to the wider church and as ready for leadership. Now our task is to um, help change the culture. And of course, this was a major theme of, of Leadership Roundtable Summit. Our task is to help change the culture so that older leaders, ordained religious and lay in the church, naturally seek out these well-formed young adults who are ready for service at the tender age of 22 and 23 and 28 and and pave the way for receptivity onto these governing boards. It's a tremendous program. I know, Carrie, and you put a lot of yourself into it when you were the uh, executive director of the roundtable, and, and it really has come to great fruition. I wonder if we could turn our conversation for just a moment uh, to what you referred to as this as the culture of co-responsibility. And I think culture was one of the biggest themes that um, that we talked about throughout the, it was the underlying theme, I should say, that, that was in so many of our conversations, this culture of co-responsibility, of mutual accountability, of transparency. Um, and, and I noticed that very intentionally on, on many of the documents, the questions and such, you really referred to that culture. Uh, of, that we have here in the church and how we're trying to change. And now the conversation was intended to change that culture. And can you say a little bit about that? Yes, absolutely. And you're, you're, you're right on target. That was, that was the theme that uh, was at the heart of the entire planning of this summit and woven throughout all of the presentations. I think what we we mean by a new culture of leadership in the church is emphasizing the 
central importance of baptismal responsibility. We have been for the last more than 20 years, really, but certainly since 2002, when the sexual abuse revelations came to the consciousness of Catholics um, and and others in the United States in a, a kind of unrelenting and absolutely heartbreaking and scandalizing way, we have been addressing and attending to the worst crisis the Catholic Church has faced, certainly in our lifetimes. It would have been tempting to say, for example, as you know, a layman yourself, as a laywoman myself, we didn't cause this. We did. We're not uh, responsible for this. This is not our doing. And wipe our hands of it. That's tempting, but not faithful, because to do nothing is to be complicit. A new culture that understands baptismal responsibility, that by virtue of belonging to this faith family, I have a responsibility to help heal this family when it is in crisis. It is my responsibility as a member of this faith family who holds the potential of the church in the highest regard, it is my responsibility to do everything I can to affect healing and reconciliation in the church. First and foremost, because of the preferential concern for victim survivors and the harm that has been done to them. Extending from that in concentric circles, all of the the many priests of goodwill and of of ethical behavior um, who with whom I have worked for for many, many decades, they are painted with this same paintbrush to this day continue to experience the the shame and the heartbreak that has unfolded. So the question before all of us who are members of this faith family is, what does this crisis mean for us? And how are we going to exercise baptismal responsibility? How are we going to bring our particular unique gifts to effect healing and reconciliation, to call the church to greater levels of holiness, to insist on accountability, on openness, and on responsibility so that we can restore trust in the church, restore trust in church leadership, remove the obstacles that impede the church's mission from full flourishing. And in one sense, this has been at the heart of the reason Leadership Roundtable was found it to begin with. The sexual abuse scandals in 2002 were the catalyst for the creation of Leadership Roundtable. And Jeff Boisey, the founder of Leadership Roundtable, believed that to do nothing is to be complicit. Now, he and others of us Admit it, we knew nothing about sexual abuse, but we knew a lot about ethics, about integrity, about accountability, about responsibility, and we felt a moral obligation to bring together and form a network of leaders, half from the church and half from the secular world, all of whom were Catholic and harness the collective managerial, financial, communications, technological expertise at hand. Our intention has always been to focus on the contemporary temporal challenges, the the challenges associated with managing people, facilities, property, and finances, which we have to get right for the sake of the mission of the church. 
Well, it must have been so gratifying when the PA grand jury broke loose. Um, I saw an interview with Kim Smolik, uh, your CEO, who said that over 50 dioceses had contacted the roundtable when this last uh, round of allegations was made in, in Pennsylvania. As, as horrifying as that was and has as much uh, problems and sorrow and pain that has come out of that, um, for you as a, as, a, as a board, as an organization, to then suddenly realize, you know, the potential. And, and I know that that wasn't the moment that you realized your potential, but, um, but to be there uh, when that broke loose must have in some way at least kind of affirmed your mission and your place and the need for the things that you've been working towards for the last 15 years. Absolutely. Um, it has been 15 years formally this year that Leadership Roundtable has been um, an active resource for the church in the United States. And and now as global ambassador, uh, I have the privilege of taking the resources we offer the church in the U.S. and examining how we can apply these resources to the universal church. But after the Pennsylvania grand jury report and the McCarrick revelations, you are exactly right to note that we were immediately approached by some 50 dioceses in the U.S. for specific help in this new wave of crisis. Now, the only way we could have been positioned to be a trusted resource like that at that moment in our church's history is by the preceding 14 years of fidelity to our mission. Um, we have been intentional about never wading into doctrinal matters. We encourage among our participants in our convenings, full candor and charity. So there are no discussions off limits. But as a leadership roundtable, our contribution to the church will always be in the area of management of people, finances, technology, communications, the, the sort of business side of the church, if you will. We would never advocate something that is contrary to magisterial teaching or violates ecclesiology or contradicts canon law. This is one way we have demonstrated that we can be a humble but effective partner to bishops and cardinals and provincials and other church leaders. We are deeply, intentionally, faithfully Catholic, very cognizant of magisterial teaching, ecclesiology, and canon law. We um, create solutions to contemporary managerial challenges facing church leaders and imbue it, vet it through the lens of canon law. So, and, and we also attend to being careful about translating language. You can imagine, Jim, especially since you have participated in our, in our convenings, that we have a room filled with secular CEOs who happen to be Catholic and cardinals and archbishops. Each of them is often speaking about the same thing, but using very different language. On the one hand, you have the language of the church, of our faith. And on the other hand, you have the language of international commerce or corporations. Now, making sure we translate it so that everyone is aware that we have a common understanding is critical to our success. But when you think about this in the context of culture, of course this matters because it is one ingredient in setting the stage for trusting relationships and partnerships. And this doesn't happen overnight. There is no easy, quick fix for this. It just requires deliberate, tenacious fidelity to purpose and mission, 
a, a kind of prayerful checking always that our intentions are sound, extending the benefit of the doubt, presuming goodness in one another, that everyone in that room cares deeply about the health and vitality of a vibrant, welcoming church, an effective church. And together, we can harness the collective and diverse uh, perspectives and expertise to analyze the challenge in a more comprehensive way. That's what diversity allows. And to come up with solutions that will be effective in addressing contemporary serious challenges. It has been an incredible blessing to the church to have this resource and this model with this commitment of qualities and guiding principles assist us in discerning how to strengthen the church that we love. So Carrie, one of the big challenges that we face right now and and was brought out in the conference was, you know, just this need for financial transparency and uh, some of the conversation that was had around consistent reporting among dioceses, among parishes, uh, the need for transparency. Uh, There was even a comment that was made, the next great scandal in the church is going to be a financial one. I I wonder, how did you uh, how did you all disseminate some of that? conversation around the need for financial transparency as as a fundraiser as somebody who's worked in that space for quite a while you know we've seen more and more foundations pop up around the diocese in fact a recent study saw about 140 out of 180 dioceses now have separate foundations all ma- many of them managed in different ways but with lay boards and stronger accountability and stronger transparency and and certainly that has made donors that has instilled more confidence in donors um, but there's still obviously a lot more work to be done at the diocesan level before donors feel that this issue has been addressed but what what were the uh, what were some of the outcomes or some of the takeaways you saw from that piece uh, at the round table I'm so glad that you raised this because in addition to the prayerfulness of the of the two days together and in addition to a focus in a very concrete way on young adult leadership in the church this piece financial ethical management was really critical to our discussions and there was a moment during the conference where I felt as though we were at a pivotal point that we were hearing a prophetic voice of someone who has dedicated his life to the church and to the priesthood call us, all of us who were gathered, to account for the church's financial health and its financial practices right now in this moment. There was a sense of we cannot afford to ignore this, to wash our hands of it. We have to collectively attend to it now, lest we be complicit in further financial disarray, unethical practices, poor practices, et cetera. And it, it was a palpable moment right at, the, right at the center point of our gathering that I think left everybody with a sense of responsibility. Now, you and I have both um, dedicated our lives in a particular way to strengthening the financial health of the church. My background is in Catholic philanthropy. I was born to a family that has a 75-year history of serving the church through the instrument of a private foundation dedicated exclusively to supporting the Catholic Church's diverse ministries and apostolates all over the world. I fell in love with the church through this lens of seeing ordained religious and lay leaders all over the world responding to human suffering in the name of their Catholic faith by doing everything possible to alleviate that suffering, to champion justice, to provide catechesis and education, 
to advance justice in the world, to work toward eliminating extreme poverty, to providing health care, to encouraging and fostering peace and reconciliation. These child heroes and heroines of mine did all of this demanding, relentless work with a palpable sense of joy and purpose because they were so obviously close to Christ and wanted to bring the hope of Christ's love to others, especially those on the margins who were suffering. That compelled me to love the church and to see the church as the largest global humanitarian network in the world. Although the church's religious mission has formed the woman I am, the fact that our church is the largest global humanitarian network in the world has made me forever committed to its health and vitality. Finances are one piece of the many resources at our disposal. And how we care for those finances will illuminate the degree to which we are committed to ethics, transparency, holiness, openness, honesty, integrity. So I thought that that moment in our summit, which really placed a spotlight on how we as a as a people of faith are treating our finances, how we are fundraising, how we are accounting for our our finances, how we are um, setting budgets, which it was made clear are moral documents, how we care for the finances entrusted to us is of absolute paramount critical importance if we are to achieve a new culture of leadership and restore trust in the church and its leadership once and for all. Carrie, so well said. And, you know, I, I remember that moment uh, so clearly and all of us just really taking a step back and a deep breath, realizing that, you know, that there isn't anybody else who's going to step up and deal with this, that that the Catholic leaders that exist today have to address, you know, and we in the room have to be a part of addressing that solution. And so very well said. And and, and I also loved that that comment that uh, budgets are moral documents. And uh, and even just trailing back to what we said originally about young adults and and that uh, one, of the, one of the folks mentioned that, uh, Young adult ministry is oftentimes one of the first things cut in a diocesan budget if um, if the budget has a constraint and um, and that's a moral decision uh, and and certainly cuts out a certain generation that can make a, a huge impact on our church. Yes, and it all fits together, obviously. So, if there are no young adults on diocesan finance councils no young adults on parish pastoral councils and on boards of trustees of Catholic charities, then it's almost as though they're forgotten when it comes time to do the responsible demanding work of setting a budget. So one thing that is is core to Leadership Roundtable's advocacy on behalf of the church is the importance of diversity at the tables of decision-making. It's one reason why we are also so intent on promoting and elevating the role of women in the church and at the tables of decision-making. We believe it is a matter of managerial and moral urgency. And it is not that young adults are smarter or more prophetic than older adults, or that women are more capable than men, or that laity are more experienced than the ordained. No, it's simply that diversity matters. We all have a piece of the wisdom and a perspective to offer based on who we are in the church. And the more diversity of viewpoints, the better the analysis and the better the solutions. 
these specific recommendations that are coming out of the summit that we are collating and will produce in a report to be disseminated to to your listeners and to anyone with a stake and a vested interest in a healthy, reformed, uh, vibrant church, these specific recommendations will um, all fit together in, in a really beautiful blueprint for how we can collectively go forward. You know, I remember when your cousin was up there on that panel, uh, Pat McGrory, and he made that comment, the uh, the piece of the wisdom, that, that none of us have the wisdom, but we all have a piece of the wisdom. And that's so well said, Carrie, that, uh, that, that that wisdom has to be represented by a diverse population of different ages and different socioeconomic backgrounds and different professions. And I think you've done that so well. Uh, as a roundtable with this summit. Um, just some closing thoughts. So you mentioned the report that's going to be coming out uh, I had uh, in, in April, I believe. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, we, we were very thoughtful in planning this summit. Um, 260 people. We uh, broke the assembly into small tables Each table had a facilitator and a scribe, and all of the salient points and concrete recommendations at the table discussions and in the plenary sessions, the clarion call to action from the panelists and presenters, everything was captured, and we are now in a rigorous process of collating them kind of grouping them into themes and will, of course, introduce this with with an executive summary uh, so that as much of the fruit of the summit as possible can be widely disseminated. Of course, this this is our second summit. Um, The last year was a similar format issuing in a similar report, which was shared called Heal the Body of Christ. And that can be found on Leadership Roundtable's website. Last year's summit, of course, was specifically about the twin crises of sexual abuse of children and vulnerable adults and a a distrust of church leadership and its, its handling of this crisis. So this year, we picked up from there and were envisioning a more vibrant church. We were more future-oriented. And I think that listeners will be well-pleased by how specific and concrete the recommendations are, how many of them there are, and it's certainly food for thought and action on the part of all of us. And we absolutely will make that report available and we'll forward it to all of our listeners when it comes out. And I recall as I was part of last year's summit, all of those uh, recommendations were very concrete and and certainly could be food for for thought and, and conversation for a parish council, for a diocesan finance council on, on just many levels, I think, of church and diocesan governance. So, Carrie, uh, before we close up, I just wanted to uh, say how excited we are to, to be working with you in the Hartford Bishops Foundation, where Changing Our World is conducting a major campaign. And I know our mutual friend Gavin Mooney uh, and the team enjoys working with the group out there. Yes, it is so wonderful when uh, I have many opportunities to work with you and your colleagues, both at the local diocesan level, the national level, and the international level. So what what a joy. Well, thank you again for being on the program today, Carrie. It was it was wonderful to hear you uh, articulate so well the great mission of the roundtable, the importance of of the work that is happening at the national level, and and what we can all expect, and and that dialogue that can then trickle down to all of our parishes and schools and dioceses, and and just continue that good conversation of advocacy and transparency, and just great things. I'm sure yet to come from from these conversations and deliberations. Yes. Thanks so much for having me on your podcast. I've really enjoyed having this discussion with you. Thank you, Carrie. Take care. God bless. I want to thank Carrie for being on our show this week. Carrie is a one in a million, and I feel very fortunate that she took the time to be on our program today. 
If you'd like more information on the Leadership Roundtable, please visit them at leadershiproundtable.org. And to cap off this episode, I want to let you know that I've already booked Kim Smolik, who is the CEO of the Roundtable, to be on our show in the spring, where we'll bring you the full report from this past weekend's summit and the Leadership Roundtable. I hope you'll join us. Well, that's our show this week. Many thanks to the Changing Our World podcast team and to Pottery Studios for their support of our show. Listen, if you'd like to leave a comment about today's show, please visit us at advancingourchurch.com and click on Leave a Voicemail. We'd love to get your feedback. If you'd like more information about our show, please visit us at advancingourchurch.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Advancing Our Church is a production of Changing Our World, and we are a fundraising and social impact consulting firm that has been advising both nonprofits and corporations for the past 20 years. For more information, please visit us at changingourworld.com. Well, have a great week, everybody. Thanks for all you do to advance the mission of our church. Take care and God bless.